All right. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this uh, webinar discussion and information sharing on the contract management quick reference guide um, offered by the Caltrans Division of Local Assistance and hosted by the California Local Technical Assistance Program. I'm Tom O'Brien. I'm the director of the California um, LTAP Center. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we ask that you please keep your mic and video off during the presentation. Uh, we'll be using chat to share information and capture your comments and questions. And you can drop those in throughout. We want this to be as dynamic as possible with a large group. Um, but we will have breaks uh, specifically to address questions. Today's lecture or today's workshop will be a mix of lecture, Mentimeter polling and Q&A. Our goal is to get to everyone's questions, but if anything gets missed, um, which will be the um, which will reflect a lively discussion, we'll uh, offer um, responses to questions uh, offline by email. Um, we are going to be using Mentimeter polling, and you can log into Mentimeter by going to www.menti.com, as you can see on this slide. The code is posted there, which you will enter, and that will allow you to engage and provide your, your feedback and answer to some survey questions. That code um, and the link will also be posted in the chat. Uh, everyone should have received a copy of today's presentation by email, but just in case, we'll be dropping relevant links and contact info into the chat box as well. Uh, this webinar uh, is being recorded and will be posted to the California LTAP YouTube channel later this week. Um, we'll be spending um, just over a couple of hours today, which includes questions um, and the presenters making themselves available um, after. Uh, they're going to stay on to answer any questions. Uh, it will include a 10 minute uh, break at approximately 10 o'clock. And as, then, as I said, we'll close with, with Q&A. Our presenters today are Daniel Burke, who is the Program Reviews and Outreach Branch Manager with the Caltrans Division of Local Assistance, and Bing Liu, who uh, is with the Architecture and Engineering Branch uh, of DLA. As I said, my name is Tom O'Brien. I'm the director of the California LTAP Center. Um, we are one of 51 centers nationally. Um, that includes all 50 states and Puerto Rico. Uh, it's a program sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration and each state DOT uh, to sponsor local technical assistance um, for agencies, organizations throughout the state. Uh, we do provide local, rural, and tribal road agencies with training, technical assistance, and tech transfer services to help them manage and maintain roadway systems, um, all in the service of improving the safety and performance of California's transportation system. California LTAP is designed to be a one-stop shop. Uh, we, we want you to come to our website to get information on news, events, and training. Um, we are interested in all agencies within the state that includes um, rural, tribal um, groups that have not taken advantage of California LTAP uh, before. We hope that this is an, an exciting introduction to that. Um, and we are interested as well in showcasing local agency innovation. Um, and we, one of the ways you can do that, I'll mention in a minute, is, is uh, connect with us in a variety of ways so we can stay on top of the work that you're doing. Um, the California LTAP is um, um, organized uh, and, and managed through the, the California Caltrans DLA, and we do it in partnership with both Sacramento State and um, UC Berkeley's uh, ITS program so that we have um, statewide coverage and um, Shared, shared interest in making sure that all of your local technical assistant needs are met. We do want you to engage with us. Um, we want our relationship to be two ways. So we're not just pushing out information, but we wanna hear from you. 
Uh, we'd love you to start by visiting our website, which is at caltap.org. Uh, you can see our, our newly launched um, uh, training uh, programs uh, list there. Uh, we want it to be, as I said, a one-stop shop for, for training information. If there are particular requests you have about the work we do or ideas for training, um, we hope that you'll send us an email at admin at caltap.org. And we really would like you to follow us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, and on YouTube, where you can see uh, the, the taped versions of our webinars. Um, this is our, the best way of, of staying engaged with you. And um, we, will, we are promoting already um, the uh, Build a Better Mousetrap program, which, as I mentioned, is one way to showcase uh, local innovation and innovation within Caltrans as well. Um, with not just a statewide audience, but a national audience as well. With that, um, I am going to pass uh, the baton over to Daniel Burke with the Division of Local Assistance um, to get the show started. So Daniel, take it away. And I see my mute button works. Thank you so much, Tom. So my name is Daniel Burke. I'm with the Caltrans Division of Local Assistance here. And this training, and thank you everybody for attending this training. This training is the Contract Management Quick Reference Guide. We do cover topics of architectural and engineering, but the focus is on managing contracts and administering those contracts. As I mentioned, I work for the Division of Local Assistance, specifically in the Program Reviews and Outreach Branch. My email is down below there in case you need to email me. We have a great website here, Local Assistance, where we have all the information you need. I'm just gonna pop it open here. We'll take a quick, brief tour. We have um, you know, about the local assistance, but we also have excellent items on here, including uh, the LAPM. We have LAPG, Local Assistance Program Guidelines. You know, this, is, this again is a nice tool for our local public agencies and tribal partners to use uh, for certain references and as well, we have training down here as well. Hopefully, eventually, we'll be able to get all the training loaded onto this website. Here we have information about our partners, um, Center for International Trade and Transportation. Those are our partners at Cal State Long Beach. Tom and Scott are hosts today. Thank you so much. And we have some training classes down here as well, including uh, slides from the Federal Aid Series, Labor Compliance, Resident Engineers. I'm not going to go through everything today, but we do have a lot of resources on there, which I'd love for everybody to view you know, in case you do have any questions. I'm gonna hand things over to my associate and colleague, Bing. Go ahead, Bing. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Bing Liu. I'm with the Headquarters Division of Local Assistance uh, Architectural and Engineering Branch. Uh, just a quick note about our session today. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to mention that this uh, presentation is only meant to reflect the quick reference guide and to highlight some contract items and guidelines policies that should assist you with managing federally funded a &E consultant contracts. So we are not going into the details of a consultant contract procurement process, which we do plan to cover in more details in separate a &E training sessions later this year. And Daniel, if you could uh, hit that link for the a &E website. So here is the any &E, uh, website resource webpage. Uh, we've got a, a lot of great uh, resources in here. Uh, we have like sample format, formatted documents that you could use as a reference. Uh, we have checklists for you where you can uh, go through the any &E procurement process, just making sure that you've hit all the, the, the required items. We have some uh, resources and we also have some short training videos and on specific topics that uh, you can use as uh, an aid while you are doing the consultant procurement. All right, thank you and I'll, I'll hand it back to Daniel. Hey, thank you so much, Bing. So as Bing had talked about, this, is, this training is more concerned with the management and administration of contracts. And specifically it covers the contract manager quick reference guide. So this, the contract quick, uh, the manager's, <laughs> the contract manager reference guide is a, you know, it's about a 30 page document. 
And we're just going to cover and highlight some of the areas here. And we're going to go in actually the, the order here of the topics or the, the sections of the chapter. And this is specifically to go through basically the concept of, of say, hey, you know, maybe I do need a consultant contract to the termination and closeout of the contract. And again, this this con this uh, quick reference guide is designed to allow our local public agencies and tribal partners to go ahead and click on a section where they're on to continue forward. You know, let's say, for example, you're interested in, you know, writing the scope of work for a contract. Well, you just click on this section and here is the scope of work that you can go ahead and review and get some requirements for this and also some best practices. So that's mostly what this training will cover is the requirements for contract management and also the best practices. And, you know, as we mentioned, this is a guide. It's not a local public agency requirement, but it is set up and available for you to help do your jobs. Um, you know, it's, we often do get questions in the district and in headquarters, you know, about specific items of contract management. And so this, this guide is supposed to help facilitate and answer some of those questions so that you can look it up very quickly and move on to the next area or next responsibility that you have as a local public agency or as a tribal agency. So the first part that we wanna cover within the contract management quick reference guide is, you know, we wanna make sure that the funds are authorized. So before you can, you know, really consider moving forward with procuring a consultant, the funds have to be authorized, whether you're going through the preliminary engineering, right of way, or construction phase of the contract. So the funding should be programmed if you want it to be federally reimbursed or state reimbursed. It needs to be updated in the federal state improve, state transportation improvement program or the FSTIP. So that's if you're a small agency and you do not report up through an MPO or into the FTIP, the Federal Transportation Improvement Program, if you are an MPO or if your agency reports up to an MPO for your programming purposes. In addition, if you have to submit an allocation request, it must be approved by the California Transportation Commission before those expenditures are eligible for reimbursement. And specifically, if your project is federalized, we need to have a request for authorization to be fully executed and authorized and a notice to proceed issued from headquarters Caltrans Division of Local Assistance. There are two exceptions for federal reimbursement and there is some risk involved and they, they both pretty much cover the same areas. You may go ahead and uh, conduct preliminary studies before authorization occurs. And this is before optional or mandatory field review. So basically you're, you may need to have a consultant come out and look at some pre-design work. And the thing is, is that you'll need to make sure that that program is obligated and that a request for authorization is submitted for federal reimbursement of those funds. If, if the request for authorization is not approved and not fully executed, Caltrans cannot reimburse you for those funds. So again, there is some minimal risk involved. And again, 1440, Section 1440 kind of allows the, the LPAs to go along a, a similar route. And so again, you know, we, we really want to make sure and hone in that Caltrans cannot reimburse our local public agencies and tribal partners for federal work until those funds are authorized. So let's make sure that that step is taken. Just remember to, to go ahead and do that if you are expecting or anticipating your preliminary engineering work to have federally reimbursable funds placed onto there. So let's talk about the need for a contract. How do we know we need to hire a consultant? Sometimes we, we can't find a, a partner to help us out. You know, whether it's internally, we don't have staff who have the expertise, or maybe we partner well with a larger agency or uh, other agency, or we have other resources we can tap into. But the crux of the problem comes down to the, the same point. The work has to get done. How are we going to do that? Well, that's when it's time to perhaps seek out and develop a contract. And so when we're considering the need to develop a contract, we want to look at services. 
What type of services are you going to put onto that contract? Do you need design work? Do you need environmental work? Do you need to have studies conducted? Or maybe it's just construction engineering and you need to have a consultant who's very familiar with the design and whose subject matter expertise follows that design. Are you going to have a project specific, meaning it's only going to apply to one project? Or are you gonna be trying to create what we call a, excuse me, that, that term has just slipped out of my mind. <laughs> It's called an economy of scale. Are we going to create an economy of scale where we're going to be using one contract and perhaps putting the consultant onto multiple types of projects? So there's a five-year max for that type of on-call project where there might be multiple projects utilized or multiple areas reviewed. So we want to keep in mind, you know, whether it's just going to be one project or whether we're going to have one on-call contract with task orders issued. And remember, that's a five five-year total that we can only put onto that on-call contract. Are there diverse services that can be subcontracted out? Will we need to use a disadvantaged business enterprise or are we going to have to develop a goal? These are concepts that we'll have to consider and put onto there. Does the agency have any resources that they can lend out to the, to the consultant to have perhaps save costs, to perhaps utilize equipment such as survey tools on site? potholing equipment? Maybe. And what types of approval steps are needed? Can we do this internally within your public works division or departments of transportation? Or does this need to be approved by your city council or county board of supervisors? These are all items that we need to identify and think about as we start building that timeline and milestones for executing that contract and looking into, are we gonna be able to meet the program and our next steps? into the overall project. So some very good information there that's available in the contract manager reference guide. I'm gonna hand things over to Bing, who's gonna talk more on the A&E side of the house. Go ahead, Bing. All right, thanks, Daniel. Uh, so Daniel had uh, briefly mentioned already about uh, different types of uh, A&E contracts. Uh, generally, there are two types of consultant contracts and that are the on-call and project specific contracts. Now the on-call is typically used for services that are of indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity in nature. And some requirements of this type of contract, including again, establishing a uh, contract period that uh, which must not exceed five years, as well as designating a maximum dollar amount in the uh, contract. Uh, as an on-call contract, the contract can be utilized for multiple projects where task orders are issued on an as-needed basis. With a project uh, specific contract, uh, that is between the local agency and the consultant on which type of uh, for the performance of services um, and a defined scope of work uh, must be uh, included and related to a specific project or projects. Now, the project specific contract could include multiple sections where, uh, where it's broken down into uh, different uh, phases. And usually the defined uh, scope of work then is divided into these uh, phases, which may be negotiated and executed individually as the uh, project progresses. Uh, next slide, Daniel. There are several guidelines for a uh, consultant contract. Uh, as a starting point, if the contract uses and seeks reimbursement for local assistance related funds, the uh, consultant contract procurement and selection process guidelines and policies uh, are contained in the Division of Local Assistance, um, Local Assistance Procedures Manual, Chapter 10. Hereafter, I'll just refer to it as uh, LAPM, which is our procedures manual. Uh, moreover, the agency must have formally adopted Chapter 10 uh, in one of two ways, via an agency board resolution, like uh, through your uh, city council or county board, or a letter from the public works director or equivalent level. Uh, these adoption method details are contained in our Chapter 10. I believe that's in uh, Section 10.1.10. 
Uh, for any um, consultant contract, a full-time agency employee must be designated as the employee in responsible charge, uh, no exceptions. And uh, with good contract management practice, retain all project consultant contract records and documents in the project files. Uh, the, the retention uh, period is a minimum of three years after the final uh, voucher. Next slide, Dean. So during the um, contract planning stage, oops, <laughs> that's a Mentimeter, sorry. <laughs> Oh, you're on mute, Daniel. Thank you, Ming. <laughs> hey, Scott, did you want to go ahead and introduce us into the Mentimeter? So from a second device or perhaps in a, a separate window, you're going to turn sure. the code. I'm going to turn things over to Scott. Let me bring this up, Daniel. Sure. So some clever Mentimeter users have already jumped in and got started. Uh, I'm going to open up. As uh, Sherry's been telling us, go to uh, menti.com and enter the code 32384444. Uh, I'm going to open up voting now. Let's see if I can do that. Okay. And uh, we started off with pretty simple one. Should agencies follow the contract manager's quick re reference guide as a best practice? And guideline choices are yes or no. Since this is a gimme, we'll just give you a couple seconds for everybody to jump in, make sure that you can access Menti and, and you're ready for us. But I'm encouraged by the 3% that say no. We look into for some answers, uh, some some suggestions in the Q and A box from there. So let's take a look at uh, at the answer for this one. And of course, it's yes. Why is it yes, Daniel? Thank you, Scott. So we don't we don't require agencies to adopt this. This is not actually a part of the local assistance procedures manual. So good job, everybody, to the ninety seven percent. It's an easy to use reference guide while building and administering a procurement contract and is not a mandated policy. A couple of other items I wanted to, well, one other item I wanted to bring up right now is, you know, we had developed the contract manager reference guide because we received a lot of audits where a contract management and <clears throat> was a finding. And it could be through procurement or just general contract management through uh, construction or other areas. And so we thought to ourselves, you know, let's build a quick reference guide to help alleviate some of that risk that's, so we can reduce some of those findings that we see in audits. So this is why we created the reference guide and it's not, it's not adopted uh, per se as part of the LAPM and it's outside. So that is the reason why it's just a reference guide. We encourage agencies to follow it. Thank you, Scott. Okay, second question. Which is not an item a contract manager would need to identify when developing a contract? And your choices are specific needs, services, potential consultants, or approvals needed. We'll take about 10 seconds for this one. It looks like there's some uh, some consensus on potential consultants. Let's see what the correct answer is. Potential consultants. So we can we can identify consultants in a pre-award meeting to generate more qualified proposals. You can encourage them to say, "Hey, come out and bid," and describe the specifics of the scope of work within the pre-bid meeting. However, the focus of the contract development should be on the services needed, not specifically who we're going to award it out to. Thank you, Scott. Okay, question three. Which is not a type of a &E contract? On-call, project-specific, construction only, or multi-phase project-specific? Uh, 
It's a good reminder that I need the Jeopardy tune right about now. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we've got some nice consensus building around construction only. Let's take a look and see um, if that's anywhere close to correct. Construction only. So it's being discussed, there is no type of contract that is specific to a single project phase. Uh, do we have another question, Scott? Yeah, one more question. Who may, be, who may an agency nominate as the employee in responsible charge? And should that be the employee performing project oversight, a consultant in a management support role, or a consultant specializing in state or federal funds administration? This is the bonus round. Okay, we've got, we've got quite a few employee selections here. Let's see, let's see if that's correct. Agency employee. So as being had mentioned, the employee responsible charge must be an employee of the agency. And the reason for that is they need, need to perform oversight of all project phases. There should be no conflict of interest, meaning that they're, they're not awarding their own firm uh, consultant contracts or making payments to themselves. And it is a requirement in the federal regulations within 23 CFR 172. All right, awesome everyone. Daniel, I'll return it to you. Thank you everybody for participating in the Mentimeter. So it looks like everybody had learned quite a bit. And let's look and see if we have any questions here. I thought I saw one in the chat. Give me just a moment here. I will pull up the chat. And let's see here. Here's we have somebody helping out with an answer. Just a moment here. So Jose Ledesma asks, how do we set a chat or how do we set a DBE goal for on-call contracts when you don't know how much work you're actually going to give out? So let's so see Jessica responded, you know, as a best practice, our agency doesn't set DBE goals on on-call contracts. We have them as race neutral. I'm curious to, oh, so how does uh, Caltrans <laughs> consider DBE goals? So let's go ahead and answer that question. I'm gonna do it the best I can and you know, Bing, Bing help me out here. The way I understand a contract and how a contract works is Title, uh, title 49 Part 26 of the Fed, Code of Federal Regulations points to and requires DBE goals to set on federal aid contracts. And we'll get a little more into this in the next couple of slides. So if an on-call contract is just serving as a list, then, so there's, when it's a two-step contract, if it's a request for qualifications and it's just establishing a list of consultants that you're going to be uh, selecting and issuing RFPs, requests for proposals from, that is not typically what we think of as a contract. You are not, provide, you are not guaranteeing payment for a service. When it is an on-call project, when it is an on-call contract for multiple types of projects, we will require that an overall DBE goal be set. And then once the task orders are issued, uh, I believe the process is to complete an Exhibit 1002. Don't quote me on this, but I believe that is it. I'll do a little more research on it. That is not my area of subject matter expertise. I haven't been in the DBE realm for a few years now, but that is my recollection of the process is to you know ensure and update that Exhibit 1002 for each of the task orders. Bing, do you have any more insight on this process working in the AD field more directly? 
No, I, I think uh, you generally uh, covered the uh, the requirement. I did want to mention that uh, for a DBE goal, it needs to be set at the master on uh, for an on call contract. It needs to be uh, set at the master contract level. Once you have a task order established, then of course you calculate it based on that task order. But at the end of the day, all of the task orders added together should meet that master level DBE requirement. Okay, so there's another question down here as well from Riley. When evaluating cost proposal forms, formerly the 10H, when a prime or first tier sub has a non a &E sub, is there guidance for how we determine whether it's best to list that non a &E sub as a lower tier sub? Now let's scroll down here to get to the rest of the question, which of course doesn't want to work. There we go. Or the prime or first, first tier subs cost proposal. Ping, did you want to take a shot at this question? Uh, we will cover a little bit of cost proposal uh, later on in this uh, presentation. So maybe we can table this question then. Okay, excellent. Let's see here. So I, I kind of want to cover the DBE goal questions a little later on in the presentation. And you know, if we don't get to all these questions, we're going to go ahead and set up a, a, a separate Q&A sheet to cover all the questions that we're not able to get to. So at a small agency, how would you can, let's ask, let's see another question here. As a small agency, would you hire a consultant to oversee a contract and can the employee sign in name only? Sabine, did you, did you want to host that one or I can take it? Uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so as a small agency, who would hire a consultant to oversee a contract and can the employee sign in name only? Well, it has to be the person in responsible charge who oversees hiring that consultant. So I think that answers the first part of the question. If they hire a consultant in a management support role, that consultant, uh, you will need to define exactly what role that consultant will, will be uh, conducting. And it may include signing documents and such. So I want to continue on with the, the presentation here. So we're going to go to the next slide and we'll, we'll come focus back on those questions and hopefully we'll answer some of those questions regarding the disadvantaged business enterprise. We figured there would be quite a few of those uh, in this presentation. So we'll be sure to answer them here or if we're unable to, we'll provide an answer at a later point in time where we can speak with some of our counterparts who are more of the subject matter experts over the areas of DBE. So we want to go ahead and continue with scope of work, please. So let's uh, just briefly mention a little bit about the scope of work. Uh, it should be defined and developed during the contract planning stage. And uh, generally in the scope of work, a clear, accurate, concise, complete, and detailed description of the work activities should be provided. You know, that may include, well, that usually includes technical requirements, and the qualifications necessary for the services to be rendered. So said another way, to the extent possible, the scope of work should detail the purpose and description of the project, the services to be, to be performed, deliverables to be provided, the estimated schedule for performance of the work, and the applicable standards, specifications, and policies, quality control measures, uh, acceptance criteria, as well as uh, deadlines. The determination should be made on the type of solicitations, requests for qualifications or requests for proposal, and other details that could be included in the scope of work, uh, maybe to identify the project stakeholders, as well as the payment information, more details on 
that payment payment information that you'll be, be, be providing to the consultants. Uh, next slide. So section 1.7 of the quick reference guide, the contract manager quick reference guide covers the disadvantage business enterprise in very briefly. What we'd actually suggest to do is go to chapter nine where there is a, a great deal of you know, more additional information. But we cover it very briefly in the quick reference guide because it is more fully covered in chapter nine of the local assistance procedures manual. So for any federal aid contract that even has a dollar or if it has the potential to be federalized. So if we have on-call contracts and it's gonna be partially maybe locally funded and partially federally funded, and it's gonna be federally funded at all, then the, the entire contract is considered to require the DBE goal on the, uh, for, the, for the contract that you're considering to develop for on-call, uh, for, for that on-call contract. And so even if it is as little as $1, it does need to have a DBE goal. And I'm just gonna walk everybody briefly through the, the Exhibit 9D here. And so this is, I believe, uh, this one here is, let's see if we have one here for, oh, we do have one here for AD, excellent. So this is a sample AD that's kind of pre-filled here. You would delete out this information and you know we have you know each bid item here the approximate hours quantity needed, that's the measurement unit here, and what type of tasks are gonna be doing here. So this looks like a lot of project management here, the first three, and you know perhaps you have some public outreach, and there's other aspects too. We have some environmental studies here, some hydraulic studies, or excuse me, some um, uh, engineering studies, and we have you know unit price, our guesstimation per hour cost, and the combined out total, whether it's gonna be performed by a subcontractor. Um, so we have all this information pre-fit pre out here for you. And you can always um, review the California, uh, what do they call that? The, um, the California, uh, <laughs> excuse me, I'm not as familiar with DB as I used to be. The, um, there's a database that you go into to look up all this data and it's all within chapter nine. And that's where you're gonna find your DBEs in there. And so we have this form to complete. I'm not gonna to go too far into the details. I wanna focus on the contract management and this is not a DBE training. So I just wanted to share that we do have this information here available and referenced within the quick, uh, quick reference guide here for contract management. So for all proposers who are bidding on a contract, they must submit the exhibit 1001 with their proposal package when a DBE goal is required. So this will list out all of the percentages that needs to, that will be on the contract to reach that goal. So we'll have the description of work services, the DBE certification number if they are, you know, for the DBE, their contact info and the percent that they would be attributing towards that overall goal. Excuse me. And we strongly suggest requiring your, we strongly suggest recommending your proposer submit a good faith effort within five business days of the proposed deadline. That means they can submit it with the bid proposal or within five days after that deadline. And the reason we ask is that sometimes, look, well, that it's a requirement for local public agencies to ensure that the DBEs that the proposer are listing are qualified and can perform the work and that their calculations are correct according to the contract. So sometimes those are adjusted out. And so we require our, so we, we, we highly recommend that our proposers submit a good faith effort. And the exhibit 9E is just a template. We often see uh, some of the proposers use different types of forms, but this is just one sample to kind of get the uh, process started here and just to, kind of fill in information and see what's needed uh, as far as the documentation that a proposal will need to, to consider and display within their exhibit for a good faith effort. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about advertisements being? Sure. Uh, so before uh, advertising and soliciting 
proposals, the consultant evaluation criteria and uh, proposal score sheets need to be developed. When evaluating the proposals, uh, you should take several factors into consideration, and, and those are listed on there on the slide. So will all required services be performed? Will competent and experienced professionals perform the work? Will all technical and administrative requirements be followed? And very importantly, does the consultant have the capability and have the financial responsibility to manage that contract? Next slide. So next, we, uh, we, we have some advertisement and solicitation requirements. So advertisements must be open uh, to the public for at least 14 days. The process must be competitive. That is, it must be fair and open for all in and out of state consultants. As far as a publication medium, uh, use a widespread publication. Uh, one example is like the Planet Bids. Uh, you could also use your agency uh, website, uh, trade newspaper, et cetera. You do need to document the advertisement posting, for example, uh, by saving your screenshots and retaining these in the contract file. It's also a, a good practice uh, for the good faith estimate as well. Next slide. So we do want to mention a little bit about um, the information and requirements regarding ethical conduct. Uh, I briefly mentioned about the consultant and management support role earlier. So, uh, and I'll just use the acronym CMSR. So if the contract is to hire a CMSR uh, prior to advertisement, there are considerations and requirements for the ethical conduct and assurances that there are no conflicts of interest. You do need to fill out the Exhibit 10U, which is related to a conflict of interest statement. That, uh, that must be filled out and submitted uh, along with the contract scope of work and the agency's own conflict of interest policy document to the Division of Local Assistance. Uh, DLA staff will review it. And I do want to note that these documents will then be forwarded for review by FHWA and it does require FHWA approval prior to the advertisement. Next slide. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, we do see contract management as a finding within a lot of the audits that are received by Caltrans from our local public agencies and you know, some of our tribal partners as well. And one of the main ones that we see is that there's a lack of review and verification of suspension and debarment. And this needs to occur through one of three methods. The first is to go to, and, and it needs to be you know, documented by the agency, meaning you know, capture a screenshot when you go through the sam.gov website. And this is just to ensure the consultant is not under suspension, that they're not debarred or that they're voluntarily excluded or ineligible to perform on the contract. Alternatively, you may also collect a certification from the consultant stating that they have not been suspended, debarred, or determined ineligible by a federal agency within the past three years, or add a clause or condition to your contract that states the covered, that, that covers the transaction with that entity, meaning, you know, if you determine that they're suspended or debarred, they don't get paid. So they're basically providing the services for free um, if it's determined that they are suspended or debarred. Uh, yeah, as a best practice, I recommend just going to sam.gov. That takes the easiest, you know, hit the control print screen when you get to the, to the page that where you've went through and, you know, reviewed that consultant to ensure that they're not suspended or debarred and eligible, excluded. Uh, that's the easiest way and put it into that project file. 
I know we've mentioned project file here very briefly throughout this presentation, but it is also important to keep everything within a project file. As most of us are digital nowadays, you know, please have a separate file with that contract, with that consultant, and keep all of your information in that location so that if you ever are audited or you need to go back in there for reference, you have all the material available, available for you. And this includes key emails, obviously the proposal and review for the suspension and department, and there's other, other items that we will talk about as we go through the process as well. Looks like we have another Mentimeter here. So again, please go to the menti.com website and enter the code 32384444 if you have just joined us. I'll turn things over to Scott now. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, let's... Move on to question five. Which is not part of a good scope of work? Schedule and milestones, tasks and deliverables, independent cost estimate, or identification of potential stakeholders? Which is not a part of a good scope of work? Okay, let's see. Let's see which of these two popular choices is correct. Cost estimate. Why is that, Daniel? So the independent cost estimate is the agency's cheat sheet for negotiations. It is not included in the scope of work. I believe Bing's going to cover this later on in the presentation. And because it's after negotiations start to occur. It is not included within the scope of work. That means the consultant has already submitted their cost estimate or bid package. And uh, again, Bing will go over that in just a little bit. Okay. So good job to, to the 70% who got that correct. Yeah, all right. Question six. When is, when is good faith effort documentation not required by the proposing consultant? Would that be with a bid proposal for state-only funded projects? within five days of bid opening on a federal aid project with a bid proposal for, for a federal aid project or on the third day of a bid opening on a federal aid project. When is good faith effort documentation not required by the proposing consultant? Okay, let's, let's see where this is headed. State only funded projects. So a good faith, eff faith effort is not required on state only projects because the disadvantaged business enterprise goal is only required on federal aided contracts. So it's not going to be on state only projects. Okay, let's go to question seven. Which is not required in a proposal evaluation scoring sheet? Does it include all required services? Will competent and experienced professionals perform the work? Does the consultant have financial responsibility? Or is the consultant's price point reasonable? Give them just a few more seconds here. which is not required in a proposal evaluation scoring sheet. Let's find out. The price point. So Scott, I think we uh, <laughs> had misplaced this question into this section. It's actually covered in a future area, that's okay. Uh, it still is kind of nice because you know, the price point has to be opened up after the actual proposal is received. So once that proposal is received, we'll designate who is the most highly qualified consultant. And then at that point, we may negotiate and open up the bid proposal from the consultant. So we'll touch basis on this later on in the presentation. And this kind of also follows the scope of work, meaning that we, we only want to look at what, what's, what's in the scope of work and is the consultant that we have to select or that we're going to select 
the most highly qualified based on those characteristics to complete the job. Okay, let's let's try one more question. Which is not part of the suspension and debarment verification process? Check www.suspension.gov to ensure consultant is not under suspension or debarment. Check www.sam.gov to ensure consultant is not under suspension, debarment, or voluntary exclusion or, in, or just ineligible. Certify that the consultant has been disbarred, debarred, voluntary excluded, or determined ineligible by federal agency within the last three years, or simply none of the above. Which of these is not part of the suspension and debarment verification process? There's a, there's a tendency um, showing here. Let's find out which one of these is not part of this process. Indeed, suspension.gov, well done. Yeah, well done everybody. We tried to get a little tricky here. So glad everybody's uh, paying attention and the major vast majority of you are getting these right. So excellent job, everybody. Right. And uh, yes, back to you, Daniel. So let's take a look at some of the additional questions that came into the chat here. Okay, thank you, Sherry, for providing the link to the contract manager a quick reference guide. I apologize here, I'm having trouble scrolling through the, um, there we go, through some of the questions here. Let's see what else we have here. Okay, sharing slides, excellent. So Meje asks, how do you determine DBE goal for subrecipients? So that's within chapter nine. So it's basically any participation or opportunity that can be provided to a sub consultant. Okay. So it has to be reasonable and it will be reviewed uh, internally for, for consultant contracts that are greater than 500,000 uh, by the division of local assistance. And we also want uh, agencies as well to use their, their best objectives and to be open-minded and to provide uh, what, what is reasonable to pass down to a consultant. So for instance, in the example that we had up with Exhibit 9D, we had work that was the first four tests were comparison and uh, we're basically, let me see if I can pull this up real quick here. There we go. I just had it. Give me one moment here, my computer's not cooperating. There we go. So we can kind of see that these first three or four tasks here are associated with project management. We then have some other tasks down here which are completely separate. We're looking at some specialized uh, design and perhaps environmental reporting here. So this is the type of work that can be subbed out potentially. So we have somebody up here who might be the lead consultant performing the overall project management. And then we have specific items down here which might need to be distributed out. So that's where we would say, hey, there's an opportunity for DBEs to participate. And here it is, you know, where it's likely to be performed by a subcontractor. And we would, you know, start completing and referencing the CUPC database. It's a California Unified. <laughs> My apologies. It's where you go to look up uh, the, the DBEs that are specifics to regions and districts to districts rather. Uh, so that's where you would wanna look up that information and uh, how you would tell how much uh, work should be determined as uh, provided to the DBE. One more moment here, I'm gonna pull the chat back up. So 
So there, there are a few uh, DBE uh, questions on here. And I, I want to answer a, a couple of them here and we'll get back to them and respond to them in a Q, more formal Q&A. So one, one question asks, what happens if you lose your DBE subconsultant after the contract has been signed, but, but work has not yet started yet? Is there a time frame that you, you must meet to make a good faith effort to find a new uh, DBE subconsultant? You honestly want to get on that as soon as possible. And you do need to make a good faith effort to either replace that specific work where the DBE subconsultant, you know, perhaps is, uh, you know, either graduated from the DBE program where they're so successful, or perhaps uh, they, they can't do the job for, for reasons, too much workload. Uh, and, and, you know, they have to apologize, say, hey, we can't take on that amount of work. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're able to replace that percentage or dollar amount. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be for that specific item. So let's say, you know, one of, one of your consultants may be able to perform project management, but you, you know, there might be some good DBEs that you've worked with in the past that might be able to perform, you know, geo, geo, uh, geological studies. So at that point, you would reach out to those DBEs and make a good faith effort to replace them. And we want to do that as soon as possible to not hold up any work. So thank you, uh, Jessica, as well. Yeah, that we do have some DBE trainings. They are recording if you do go to that training website as well. And we can also, um, you know, look at, <clears throat> we can look at also um, hosting, because I do see there's a lot of specific questions regarding on-call and, excuse me, project-specific DBE questions. So perhaps we want to look at uh, hosting a training for that as well. And uh, Bing, did you want to take this question here regarding a fixed fee contract? So Meje is asking, can a fixed fee contract be used and what is the limit? Um, if my that question, the context is the payment type, uh, there, there is a contract payment type that can be used, which is um, cost plus fixed fee. Um, so the fixed fee, normally that's maybe equated to the profit side of the contract. If it's going to be more than 15% of the contract, then it there must be a very good reason and justification for for that uh, for that percentage. On another context, uh, cost proposals can include fixed fees. So yes, it, it can be part of a contract. Excellent. Thank you, Bing. Syed asks, will the Q&As be provided to attendees sometime after the presentation? Yes, they will. We will have those posted up onto the Divisional Local Assistance website, and we will work with our partners at Cal State Long Beach, the California LTAP Center, to send that information out as to where they're located once it is finalized. Noelle asks, can the 9D also serve as the independent cost estimate? Bing, what are your thoughts on that? No, it, it cannot. Is there a specific reason for that, Bing? Um, it, it, it's a, it has to be kind of a, a different form. We, we, the 9D is specifically used for the DBE calculation. You can use some of the information on your 9D to uh, you know, uh, set up another document that is the cost estimate, but uh, the 90 is only for DBE calculation. Excellent answer. Thank you, Bing. And we have, where can we find a sample of ice? Well, in the next couple of slides. And thank you so much, Jessica. Yes, that is what it's called, the California Unified Certification Program. And uh, Jessica, thank you so much for helping everybody out here and providing a link. Kudos. And thank you, Sherry, for posting where the DBE training is <clears throat> uh, provided on the website. And that's where we have all that. Let's continue to move forward here with the presentation. And uh, being if you want to talk about the most highly qualified consultant. Yes. So, uh, so again, we'll use that acronym MHQC uh, in lieu of just saying most highly qualified uh, consultant uh, several times during this presentation. 
Keep in mind that for an a &E contract, uh, when you do the consultant selection, it must be qualifications based and not based on cost. So selecting the consultant must be uh, the most highly qualified consultant uh, based on your evaluation. So make sure the um, make sure the proposal addresses all advertisement criteria and document the proposals via a responsiveness uh, checklist. The agency may deem the proposal to be non-responsive if certain items are missing, and the proposal must be rejected if it is submitted late except uh, what Daniel mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, that the DBE good faith estimate can be submitted later uh, within five business days. An important reminder that uh, the cost proposal must not be opened until the MHQC has been selected and you are in the cost negotiation phase with the selected consultant. Well, this required Makes sense, right? Because the any &E consultant selection must be based on qualifications, which I mentioned earlier, and it must not be influenced by cost. When the proposal is received, uh, that's the date and time, uh, that must be documented in the project file. And we recommend that the agency date and timestamp the proposal. Next slide. So evaluation and selection of the MHQC uh, should include uh, the following. The Exhibit 10B has suggested um, sample criteria and uh, weighted points. The Exhibit 10B is an evaluation sheet. When you set up the criteria with, uh, with the weighted points, that same criteria must be listed in the solicitation document, the RFQ. RFP. So uh, it, it can't be different. Uh, that's going to be a red flag when there's an, an audit. Reference checks must be evaluated and that must be and that should be done before any interviews. If you do have an interview round um, when doing the consultant selection, the reference checks themselves could be uh, discussed during those interviews. Keep in mind that there needs to be a minimum of three proposals. And from the proposals, the committee may develop a short list of um, MHQCs. And again, that is also a minimum of three consultants on, on that short list. If the agency so chooses, um, there can be an interview if it's stated in the solicitation. And then uh, the agency needs to develop a final ranking of the consultants. All consultants are then notified of this final ranking. Next slide. All right, so next is um, some information regarding opening the cost proposal. The consultant is to submit the cost proposal in a separate sealed envelope either with the submitted proposal or if an interview round is conducted, um, the, uh, then at the time of interview. The cost proposal is opened upon cost negotiations. And then if the negotiations uh, with a first ranked uh, consultant is unsuccessful, then negotiations can commence with a second rank uh, consultant. And that's when that second rank consultant's cost proposal is open. So uh, the pattern here is that cost proposals must not be opened until, uh, you know, like uh, negotiations, basically. Upon successful cost negotiation uh, completion, all remaining unopened cost proposals must be returned to the respective consultants or properly disposed of. So basically, the agency must not open any cost proposal from the consultants that are not selected. Uh, next slide. So we've, uh, uh, we, we've talked about the cost proposal, uh, which is prepared by 
uh, the consultant. So not sometimes there's an infusion between an independent cost estimate and a cost proposal, right? So the independent cost estimate is the one that's produced by the agency, whereas the cost proposal is done by the uh, consultant. Uh, the independent cost estimate, uh, I'll just say ICE from now on, uh, as a basis for comparison to the cost proposal, the agency must have prepared and documented an ICE, usually completed early on in the contract procurement process, like uh, in the planning stage. So items necessary for the ICE uh, include details on hours necessary to do the work, direct labor costs, indirect labor costs, other direct costs, and, and so forth. Agencies must retain documentation of how the cost estimate was uh, developed. It can be revised if needed uh, for use in negotiations with the next most qualified uh, consultant. Costs must be actual, allowable, it must be reasonable and allocable in accordance with federal and state cost principles uh, for the work performed. And as we have mentioned several times already, please keep the old documentation to justify uh, the costs in the project files. So next slide. I think somebody asked about uh, ICE example. So uh, here we have one. I, I don't know if uh, people can uh, actually <laughs> see the, the details or not, uh, but you uh, hopefully you can see that uh, some of the info put, uh, provided on this particular ICE sample includes like staff flex classifications, estimated number of hours, um, hourly rate, IT support, other direct costs, and of course, very importantly, the estimated total. I do want to mention that there is no particular ICE format that is required. Uh, that's up to the agency, as long as the necessary info is included. Uh, besides the um, example that uh, we've shown on here, I believe our any resource webpage do have um, uh, an ICE sample too. Next slide. So once the um, MHQC is selected, um, again, open the cost proposal only for the MHQC, review the costs and services with the scope of contract and also cross-check uh, with the ICE to make sure it's reasonably commensurate with the ICE. Uh, the agency will request a revised and final cost proposal from the selected consultant uh, after negotiations are complete, uh, after the local agency and consultant have agreed to a price. And very importantly, um, the agency needs to submit a financial document review package and request to the independent office of audits and investigation if that consultant contract is at or above $1 million. Uh, this is required prior to contract execution. Um, the uh, review and acceptance by IOI needs to be completed uh, before you can uh, provide the contract award to the, uh, to the uh, uh, selected consultant. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, for the contract agreement document itself, uh, we do have a boilerplate sample agreement that is our Exhibit 10R in the LAPM. Uh, the agency can use this as a reference. It does contain some necessary contract uh, language items, uh, but again, it will be up to the agency to produce the appropriate final contract language according to your project, according to the work activity. We also recommend that um, the agency gets um, advisement from the legal office for uh, the uh, contract, the contract agreement that you uh, will be producing. Ah, it's a uh, Mentimeter time again. <laughs> hey, Bing, I think we're gonna take a, 
quick bio break. Did you want to go ahead and introduce that, Scott? Yeah, why don't we take a quick 10 minute break? Uh, I'll, everybody come back around 1020. I'm going to throw a um, just a little clock up on the screen. So you've got a good indication. And once it hits zero, we'll we'll start up again with uh, with Mentimeter. Well, everybody's gone. Can I ask a question? Uh, sure, go ahead, Leighton. Um, I just posted in the um, chat, <clears throat> why are reference checks, two things, um, let me start with the reference checks. In my 17 years of experience, I've never had a reference check come back negative, <laughs> never. I'm just curious as to what value do they, they add, and I, I guess it's mandatory is why the, the, for Caltrans administered grants. Uh, I would say that uh, you know reference checks are are an important part of that uh, procurement process. Uh, like you said, you know it's uh, part of the requirement. But I think in in anything uh, there there is a, um, a reference check that is part of the process. Okay, so whether it be A and E or non A and E, it's you know, it's reference checks or are the reference check specific to A and E? Uh, right now we're discussing it specific to uh, A and E. For non any -E, -E, I believe uh, that you should also have uh, reference checks, but there are some different requirements for that, and um, uh, we we can follow up with you later on um, regarding. Non -E. <clears throat> okay, no worries. So number two, um, the I thought I heard you say earlier that uh, the proposer can submit a good faith effort within five days after the the offer is received. I, I, or maybe I'm misunderstanding. I thought if you didn't submit a good faith effort with your offer and there was a DBE goal, you're non-responsive, period. That you don't have another chance. You have to submit it with your offer. That's my question. Okay. Um, that, uh, that I think uh, like maybe Daniel can answer too. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so there's a couple different perspectives on how to answer that one, Leighton. That's a very good question. Thank you. So they need to submit the proposal within five business days. Oftentimes, um, you know, talking to a couple larger firms, they're always telling me, hey, Daniel, we get last minute uh, DBE, DBE uh, bids. And so we have to include that into our proposal. And, you know, we're, we're getting ready to send out the, the proposal and they give it to us at the last second. Well, all things considered, that's why we, you know, that's, that's why the feds allow, you know, within five business days to send their good faith effort. Obviously, if it is the most highly qualified consultant, you know, according to your view, and they did not meet that DBE goal, there are some uh, follow-up uh, conditions. The first is to conduct, uh, is to invite the most highly qualified consultant to an administrative, uh, administrative reconsideration right. hearing process. Mm -hmm. And so within that process, they're not supposed to be providing new documentation, like they, they've already had the opportunity to submit the GFE. What they should be doing is perhaps expanding on what they've already provided. Mm -hmm. So typically, and in the spirit of 49 CFR 26, they, they really you know, can only expand upon what they've provided. Perhaps there was some misinterpretation by whoever was reviewing the GFE uh, or, or something along that nature. Did, did that help answer your question, Leighton? So I just want to make sure I'm clear. The LAPM chapter nine is DB, right? And it says that we, that you can, you, you, you're authorized, that you don't have to submit your GFE with your offer. I thought you had to submit your GFE with your offer. Otherwise you're dead in the water. You can't, oh, I missed the DBE goal and then go, oh, let me submit a good faith effort. Because at that point in time, you should have done all the steps to determine that, to show that the effort you made before go um, submitting your offer. That's what I was under the impression. <clears throat> yeah, it, it must be submitted within five business days. Okay, <clears throat> got it. Yeah, one of the one of the things there for whoever was talking is, you know, they got to submit the ten oh one, which is their, um, you know, you know the DBE goal and, and what they list out all the DBEs that they listed. Um, so that's where that's the that's the requirement. Um. And but like the question you said, is when the question yeah, is that that is the, the 1001 is with the, the bid. That's how okay. we we so if they don't submit the 1001 with the bid. Yeah, yeah. But then the GFE is kind of like their supporting documentation 
which mm -hmm. they um, provide, as you mentioned, within five days. Gotcha. Yep. Thank you. Going to get the rest of my bio break minutes. <laughs> <laughs> If you're willing to, and thank you for the feedback, Riley. Yeah, if you're willing to ask and or, you know talk about a few more questions, I just heard Bing say, um, and you'll see it in my chat that the audits and investigations review um, is required before the contract can be executed yes. or even sent to the consultant, uh, and that wasn't what I thought is. Hmm. Can we see? I'm sorry. Can can, can can you state your question again? Yeah. Um. So it was stated right before the break that the um, financial document review request to audits and investigations needed to be completed and returned to the LPA before the contract could be provided to the consultant or executed. That is correct. Okay, and that's... Uh, and, and then just to clarify, that is for contracts that are uh, over a million, at or over a million. Yeah, we've we've got that situation. We've we've got a contract that we're um, negotiating, and and we're in the final steps, and it's got to go to audits and investigation. Um, and I thought it could be signed after the FDR was submitted. Um, but before we actually got the, the um, audit back. Yeah, no, because the indirect cost rate has to be reviewed and accepted first by okay. IOI. Okay. Yes. Um, um, thanks. Okay. Is, is that in, is that specific language in the L LAPM so I can show up my contracts team? Yes, it should be in that chapter 10. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Okay. That was timely for me. <laughs> okay. uh, right. I also think it's in the uh, the contract manager reference guide as well. Hey, Corey, okay. I see you have your hand up uh, as well. Did, did you have a question you wanted to ask, Corey? Hi, Daniel. Um, uh, yeah, I just had a little bit of you know we talked about a little bit about the GFE submittal, and it get it gets tricky. So the consultants are required to submit their ten oh one when they when they submit their technical proposals. The agency doesn't necessarily have to require those sealed cost proposals at that time. Um, some, some agencies do, some agencies wait and the three shortlisted firms that are gonna come to the interviews submit them or some agencies wait until they've selected that top rank consultant. And so, and then there's the contract negotiation aspect and you know scopes can change slightly and you know agencies can get that cost proposal from the top rank consultant and be like oh shoot we can't afford this we need to start taking stuff out oh we're going to self perform the outreach or we're going to self perform you know whatever it may be and all of a sudden the consultant that submitted their 1001 and you know, within five days of submitting that technical proposal, submitted a GFE based on their 1001, all of a sudden they no longer meet their DBE goal because of what is happening during contract negotiations. Or a DBE during that contract negotiations becomes decertified. And so it it gets it gets very tricky when dealing with a consultant contract GFE and when it, I, I know that the, the CFRs say five days, you know, they have five days um, to submit it. The CFRs are more written and geared towards construction contracts, you know, five days after bid opening. Um, and really bid opening on a consultant contract could be interpreted as receipt and opening of that cost proposal. And so, you know, maybe, maybe that's something we can, you know, discuss further and get some clarification with FHWA. And I don't know what the new DVE program plan looks like. 
if it if it even talks about it. But I just wanted to kind of bring that up. It is a it is tricky, um, and I do really think that it would be super beneficial for local agencies if we did have a training specific to on call. Because yeah. that yeah. seems to be a big area of. Um, sure. I wholeheartedly, I wholeheartedly agree, and um, yeah, the the language within the 49 CFR 26 I've been coached is what they would call very flexible. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning it, it can be subject to interpretation, but I, I would love to have some clarification from the federal highway administration. And as well, I think it's a great idea. I think we should have, you know, just, you know, maybe even just like a forum where we have some of these great questions, you know, like, Hey, you know, when does the goal need to be, you know, uh, created for on call or, uh, a yeah. task order or just more clarity uh, regarding both of those and you know what what FHWA would consider to be a contract uh, I might have a different perspective than they do or what the code or the intent of it does right. um, so, that, right. so that's a waste of potential and you know just some clarification so we can put that forth into the local assistance procedures manual um, so I, I think that those are some great ideas and you know what what does happen I mean I, I know what the I have a feeling I know what the answer is, what the intent of the law says regarding, you know, hey, negotiations happen. Now some of those services won't be performed and now the the goals all jumbled up. So, yeah. and you know, that there is no requirement for them to submit a second DBE goal uh, in the regulations. So th those are some great points. And I think that would be fruitful for us to, to, to discuss. And thank you so much for bringing that to my attention, Corey. Sure thing, thanks. Yeah. Maybe we're back from break. Yeah, thanks for thanks for managing that for us. Did you want to move into a Mentimeter session? Yeah, let's uh, go ahead and go. We have another uh, Mentimeter. So go ahead and uh, conduct the Mentimeter, Scott, please. Okay. So for everybody who might be just joining, join us at menti.com for code 32384444. Question nine, which is not part of the evaluation and selection process for the most highly qualified consultant or the MHQC? And the possibilities are consultant evaluations, cost proposal evaluation, final rankings, or notifying proposers proposers of their results? Which of these are not part of the evaluation and selection process? Okay, we'll go just a few more, few more seconds since there seems to be a, a predominance of voting choice for cost proposal evaluation. The actual answer is cost proposal evaluation. So we mentioned several times uh, that uh, any consultant contracts are based on the qu uh, qualifications of a consultant. And so cost is um, never a factor in, um, in selecting the consultant. Thanks, Bing. Question 10, which is not part of the good independent cost estimate of a good independent cost estimate? Only the principal investigators rates and hours, indirect cost rates, vendor travel and information technology costs, or allowable state and federal costs. Which of these is not part of a good ICE? Okay, let's find out which of these is correct. Just listing PI information is not part of an ICE. So it's not just the uh, principal staff, but all staff titles, rates, and estimate hours should be included in an adequate ICE. Thanks, Bing. And uh, question 11. When should an agency request a revised cost proposal? Would that be prior to reconciling ICE and co consultant cost proposal after execution of the contract? 
once negotiations are complete or while the agency and consultant are still in pricing negotiations. When should an agency request a revised cost proposal? Okay, let's take a look after we admit Teddy. And it is after negotiations. Yeah, so it looks like most people got it. Um, so once negotiations are completed, that's when the agency must request the cost, the revised uh, cost proposal and incorporate that proposal into the contract agreement and prior to the actual execution of the contract. Great, everybody, nice job. Daniel Bing, I'm gonna return this back to you. Hey, thank you, Scott. So we got some questions up here and uh, let's go ahead and share the presentation again. And so we have a few more questions up. We're gonna go through these briefly. We're running a little uh, short on time right now. But we'll try and get to a few of these here. Let's see where we left off. All right. So uh, during the break, uh, Riley and Bing had uh, some very good conversation here about you just stated the FDR review by IOA must be completed before the contract uh, to be provided uh, to the consultant to execute it. And, you know, can you show the, the requirement in LAPM? And his understanding was the contract could be signed after the FDR review form and uh, submitted before the review was complete and returned to the local public agency. Hey, Bing, can you uh, just follow up on, on that point, please? Yes. Yeah, so... If your contract is at or over $1 million, there's another step to the procurement process, and that is to submit a financial document review package to the Independent Office of Audits and Investigation, the IOI office. IOI will review uh, the information and will uh, look at the proposed indirect cost rate, the ICR, and uh, they may, uh, tell the agency then it needs to be revised or they will just accept that ICR rate. The agency needs to receive the acceptance letter from IOI prior to finalizing and executing the contract. Thank you, Bing. There's another question here. It says minimum three proposals are required what if only two are received? So we do understand that sometimes an agency just doesn't receive three or more proposals. And so if you receive two, you will just you'll need to document and justify why you only receive two. If you only receive one, in addition to the documentation, uh, there is an extra uh, paperwork documentation that you will need to keep in your project file, and that is to fill out the exhibit 12F, which is the public interest finding. And uh, that has to do with uh, sole sourcing. Uh, basically, it means now it's a non-competitive uh, contract uh, procurement. And actually, we'll be talking a little bit about the 12F uh, later on. I did want to mention the 12F does have to be reviewed and approved by the district local assistance engineer. Thank you, Bing. Uh, another question asks, is annual certification required if the ICR, that's indirect cost rate, does not change? The ICR needs to be updated annually. If it doesn't change, then that has to be mutually agreed to between both the agency and the consultant. I think we got time for uh, one more question here. That I see. So, can you provide some clarification for cost proposals on contracts that are less than $1 million? 
So the ICR is required to be submitted by the consultant, even though the approval is not required by Caltrans formally for these lower cost contracts. Uh, it can be a burden for some consultants and there's a safe harbor rate option, but you know, is it really necessary for contracts less than 1 million? As far as submitting for IOI review or to have a cost proposal in ICR? I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think it's, I think it's regarding you know, just having the ICR um, submitted and approved on the, oh. the lower cost contracts. Is it required if it's less than 1 million? No, it's not required. And in fact, IOI will not review the contracts that are less than 1 million. However, uh, an important clarification needs to be made that cost proposals and um, indirect cost rates are still part of the procurement process. So uh, those need to be documented. Uh, if there is an audit, then uh, those items are reviewed. So nothing has changed in the procurement process, whether the contract is at or under uh, over or under 1 million. It's just that if it's over a million, there's the extra IOI review process. Hey, excellent. Thank you, Bing. And actually, we got two really quick ones here. So if the DB goal is being met by the consultant with a proposal, do they still need to submit the GFE, FES, why? Sometimes things will change during the negotiation process, or sometimes the local public agency or tribal partner will verify what has been submitted, and it may be incorrect. They will need to have that good faith effort to back up their goal that, yes, they went through the process and selected the right uh, you know, DBE firms and that their calculations are correct. So that is why we highly recommend and encourage uh, local public agencies to encourage their proposers to submit that good faith effort. And one last question here before we uh, move on to the next section. Why is IOAI up to 30 days still required when consultant already has an acceptance ID? I assume that's for the ICR. Um, is this question in reference to uh, giving IOAI like 30 days for a review turnaround? Correct. I, I, I'm not really sure on the context of the question. It, I think it's just for the annual ICR approval. Uh, that that will have to be that question will have to be answered by IOAI. Uh, I do know that uh, you, there there is a certain workload that IOAI has to uh, complete, and so uh, there is a certain number of days and time period that uh, they do require in order to complete their review. Yeah, so they ask for up to 30 days, but when you have a consultant that just went through this process and submitted all of the, their financial documents, we're still having to submit and when they already have an acceptance ID for that fiscal period. And I'm wondering why, because it seems redundant for them and redundant for the consultant to be submitting everything twice when they, when they just got their ID. Okay. I, I think you bring up a, a good point, but... Um... Yeah, that, that will have to be best responded to by IOI. Uh, we, we can forward your uh, inquiry to the IOI office. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. Thank you, Jessica. Let's move on to the next section here. And so we already did our intermission. Go for it, Bing. Okay, so um, prior to the contract award, or at the latest, after the contract award, but before submission of the first invoice to Caltrans for reimbursement, the agency must complete the any consultant contract form. Uh, this was formally named the Exhibit 10C and to submit it in uh, the database for this any consultant contract form. I wanna note that every agency has an account to log into the database, <clears throat> excuse me, and to be able to uh, fill it out. Uh, this form, uh, again, is required for each a &E consultant contract where local assistance related federal and or state funds are involved. Um, the contract really should define the level of, of acceptability uh, of the work and uh, the consultant may be required to modify work uh, when appropriate and as needed. And then the last bullet item on this slide that's again, a repeat of, uh, of the uh, requirement or what agency should keep that we've mentioned before, 
So we cannot emphasize enough to document everything. So maintain all books, documents, papers, accounting records, and other information pertaining to costs incurred. And that's because uh, IOI does reserve the right to audit uh, any incurred costs on any contract. Next slide. Yeah, thank you so much, Bing. Uh, that, that's absolutely correct. You know, we, we can't emphasize enough the responsibility to have a well-organized project file. Let's talk about now when the contract, you know, is executed, we can almost begin to start work. So we have what's called a notice to proceed, and this occurs after the contract is fully executed, meaning signed by both parties. Uh, you know, if you're local public agency or tribal agency requires it, the council and board of supervisors must sign off on that as well. And that would be fully executed. And when the, the notice to proceed is issued, all it is is just a notification to the consultant to say, hey, you can begin your work and it is eligible for reimbursement at this point. For on-call contracts, a little bit of a different boat, they must have a signed task order uh, along with a notice to proceed. So once the task order is uh, executed between the consultant and the agency tribal or local public. A notice to proceed must be issued as well. So go ahead and start your work on the task order. One thing that we do here at Caltrans and which I highly recommend for our local public agencies and tribal agencies is to host a kickoff meeting. Let's get our expectations pulled together between the contract manager and the consultant. Heck, even have periodic meetings. We do that quite often, as I can see Scott and Tom's eyes rolling into the back of their heads. Yeah, we have meetings to make sure everybody's on the same page and that we both understand the same vision, goals, objectives, et cetera. So let's make sure that we're on track with that. And that's a really great way uh, to ensure that there's a good relationship being developed by both the contract manager and the consultant. Uh, and it's an easy way to facilitate discussion of expectations and progress on deliverables. So now that we have the contract executed, the notice to proceed issued, let's talk about some of our responsibilities as contract managers. So obviously we'd have to track the deliverables and deadlines. So deliverables might be reports that you're requiring, perhaps there are uh, requirements for payment on the contract and also some deadlines. So we wanna make sure that we were very uh, opportune, very mindful of what some of the contract periods are and deadlines where we need to have, perhaps you have your, your local public agency or tribal agency has other periods already programmed out. So perhaps this is for a preliminary engineering type of consultant contract for any consultant, but you know, you have right away, right around the corner. Perhaps it just goes straight to construction where you don't need to purchase any right of way. So we need to make sure that we're staying on top of that and that we're well aware of what those deadlines are and that you know, we can be transparent and have those meetings with the consultant and communicate to them that, hey, this is when this is going to be needed to be performed. We also need to be responsible to review and approve the invoices. That's where you're tracking the deliverables, making sure everything that the consultant is performing is within the scope of the contract and making sure the payments match up to what the agreed upon amounts were through the finalized contract negotiations. Maintain running totals of your invoices. So we need to make sure that the contract amounts are not being exceeded. Uh, Caltrans will not reimburse your agency or you know, we will not reimburse your agency if you exceed that amount. We also need to monitor the DBE. We're, that, that goes into more of the chapter nine of the LAPM, but it's called the commercial useful function. You know, have the resident engineer out there or the con, uh, contract manager checking on to make sure that the uh, the DBE work is being supported through the invoicing process. Any equipment purchases need to be documented and make sure that they're installed within the project and utilized for the project or contract rather. And here's an important one, approve and writing any key personnel changes. You hired this consultant on because they were the most highly qualified. It might be a key player, might be the project manager. How are you going to assure yourselves and how are you gonna assure Cal Caltrans that somebody new who has to come in because there was turnover, turnover happens, we get it. There as well, and, and as qualified. Make sure you have that discussion verbally and document in writing with your 
consultant. It can just be an email, but make sure you know you have that documented. It's very important, very very um, necessary to ensure that the terms and scope of the contract that you and the consultant have agreed to will be facilitated and delivered. Some other important items that we have up here are contract amendment and renewal. Please leave yourself a three to six month window for amendment. So if your contract is going to expire by June 30th, at least by April 1st, submit your contract, your finalized contract amendment scope into that process. If you need more time, make sure it's clearly alliterated why you need more time. Uh, if some of the scope has to be uh, expanded but remain within that scope, please make sure it's clearly alliterated why that needs to occur. And, and most importantly, I, I don't believe it's within this presentation, but keep the contract scope consistent. This is what you hired the consultant on to perform. Anything outside the consultant scope needs to say, need, would be a separate contract and it needs to be consistent within the scope. So let's say you've hired a consultant on to um, perform, uh, let's say it's, uh, you know, hydraulic studies. Well, you, you can't necessarily couple into that geological studies as well. That would be a separate contract and you would have to go out and seek out a new consultant or a new, actually a new advertisement for that contract. So the amendment should stay consistent within the scope. You know, if an additional report has to be performed, uh, which will increase the cost of the, the contract because it, it wasn't assumed uh, when negotiated upon between the consultant and the agency, that an additional study would need to be performed that was hyd uh, hyd hydro hydrological in nature, that is okay. That is still consistent with the scope of the contract because it was for hydrological studies. You also wanna make sure you're monitoring consultant progress, make sure they're going to be completed, making a good faith effort to do so on time. And also verify that subconsultants are registered within the industrial relations. There are quite a few categories here within the industrial relations uh, category. Categories here, they have, wow, everything that you wanted to didn't wanna know, blasting. Uh, they have construction activities. This is where you'd find the bulk of the uh, consultant process in here and electricians here too, if you need to, to perform uh, any type of electrical uh, cons uh, consulting work, you know, for let's say redesigning um, stoplights or putting new semaphores. So there's some good information on there to make sure that you're hiring uh, a knowledgeable and competent consultant. So progress payments are coming in. We have some simple ground rules. Accountants are not making advance payments on consultant contracts. We're only paying in arrears for services received. You must make progress payments within 30 days of receipt of the consultant's invoice. This is state law. This is, I believe, the California Code of Contracting. You have 30 days to pay the consultant within receipt of their invoice. The invoice must be complete and eligible. So if there is a discrepancy, please send it back. Again, this is a good thing to have documentation of. Make your own notes on the invoice itself, especially if you're able to do it electronically. Put in there what you disputed or what you don't agree with or what you have a question on. That's okay. Send it back to the consultant, get the clarifications so both of you feel comfortable making payment on it. For those of you that do a final retention payment, it must be done within 45 days of receipt of the demand. That's also known as the final invoice. So make sure all the check boxes are completed. There is no punch list and all deliverables have been performed. And lastly, no additional work is to be authorized after the contract expires. That is not eligible for reimbursement. We have a couple more responsibilities to go through here. I'm just gonna kind of breeze through some of these. So monitoring the performance, so depending on the method of payment that was set up within the contract, you know, you're gonna to need to verify hourly, monthly, item, tasks, lump sum, have been delivered and that they're being monitored and performed by the consultant. Hours worked and direct costs are incurred and consistent with the contract. We need prior approval, as I had mentioned in the earlier slide about all key staff and subconsultants being moved out. If there is just some support that's being performed in the background, we're not too concerned about that. We're, we're more concerned about the, the major issues of the, the contract. Perhaps it's the direction of everything, uh, the project management of the contract. Perhaps it's 
in very specialized work such as reporting that need to be performed such as section 105 studies. So we wanna make sure there's somebody competent hired and that the local public agency or tribal agency has approved those changes. You can also use spreadsheets to track the tallies on your deliverables. So you just put like a little checkbox, kind of tick those things off. You can also make a little checkbox uh, on the contract itself and put that on there. Also make sure that when the invoice is received that it's being timestamped, dated, and dispute the invoice. So again, you can put on the invoice, make sure you email back. And when we say in writing, email will work if work or any charges are unsatisfactory. So typically Caltrans has our rules. It's all over the LAPM, chapter three, chapter five. I'm pretty sure it's in chapter 10. So make sure you invoice at least once every six months or per the Caltrans agreement terms. The Clean California I know has quarterly. So be sure you read through your guidelines if it is a specialized type of project or funding from Caltrans and make sure that it does not have specified terms such as quarterly within the, Cal, uh, within the Clean California agreements, restricted grant agreements but the minimum for all Caltrans contract is once every six months. And as a gentle reminder, the LPA must submit to their DLAE on the first consult invoice. The DLAE is your district local assistance engineer. That's the person who is the oversight for your area or for your agency or tribe. Please put in the copy of the executed consultant contract, the issued on-call task order. If you are have an on-call contract and task orders that are issued, the certification, that's the Independent Office of Audits and Investigations approval for contracts um, that are greater than greater or equal to 1 million and the Exhibit 1001 and the Exhibit 1002, which is after the negotiations are performed and the contract is executed. If all else fails and for additional reference and guidance, please review Chapter 5 of the LAPM, which is solely dedicating to invoicing. And we do have another Mentimeter. Let's all do our part and place a Mentimeter. Scott, go right ahead, please. Okay, I know we've got a lot of questions from that last part. So we will move through these five questions with alacrity. Question 12, contract managers are responsible for reviewing and approving invoices, monitoring DB performance, approving key staff changes in writing, or possibly all of the above. What do you think? Okay, there seems to be some pretty good consensus here. It is in fact all of the above. Yeah, thank you, Scott. As, our, as far as contract managers go, we have a lot of responsibilities and those are just a few of them. So excellent job, everybody. Question 13, what else are contract managers responsible? In this case, what should they be monitoring? Deliverables and deadlines, contract amendments and renewals, consultant progress, or maybe all of the above? Everybody beep in quickly. I see we're up to 63, we're way short of 250. Let's see if these answers are correct. Absolutely correct, all three is right. Yep, we have a lot of responsibilities, so. Let's make sure that we're staying on top of the monitoring and the consultant progress. Uh, again, you know, local assistance here, we want to make sure our local public agencies and tribes hold on to their money. We don't want to see findings and question costs coming back from the results of an audit, uh, or perhaps there's a financial and eligible notice issued by the Federal Highway Administration. That is not what we want to see. So, you know, make sure we're monitoring the contracts appropriately and your consultant is performing uh, according to the scope of the contract. Next question, please, Scott. Thanks, Daniel. Question 14, which does not apply to Caltrans ground rules for contract invoices and progress payments? LPAs may not amend contracts, no additional work authorized after the contract expires. Caltrans will not reimburse LPAs for services not yet received, or LPAs must contract payments within 30 days of receiving an invoice. Which does not apply to Caltrans ground rules for contract invoices and progress payments. Got some split split decisions. Okay, let's see which of these does not apply. Amending contracts. So that was kind of a 
trick question there. Uh, <laughs> maybe we need to start reframing some of these questions here. The dots <laughs> can be confusing. So yeah, it's always highly uh, recommended that LPAs use a contract clause that clarifies the allowability of a number of amendments that are authorized for a specific contracts. We understand sometimes things take longer than expected. So let's make sure that um, you know we, we have the ability and that we provide enough time to amend those contracts. We're, we always know that sometimes you know plans change and additional studies are required. Okay, last question for this round. Question 15, what must a contract manager monitor on a consultant progress payment request? Methods of payment, hours worked and direct costs, changes in key personnel or subconsultants, of course, previously approved, or all the above. What must a contract manager monitor on a consultant progress payment request? Okay, let's take a look. All the above. So excellent, yeah, all these things have to be monitored by the contract manager. Uh, so again, we have a lot of responsibilities and these are some best practices to help uh, keep you in line with your responsibilities to monitor. Thank you, Scott. You bet. Thanks, Daniel. Before we, so I think, is this question? Yeah, we got one more. Sorry, we got one more. <laughs> Let it sink. Question 16, last question, I apologize, one more. Which is not a step to take when the consultant progress payment is received? Timestamp or date the invoice, reconcile payment and tick the invoice. Don't, con don't contact the assaultman if there are any errors or dispute the invoice within 15 days if work is unsatisfactory. Which of these is not a step to take when the consultant progress payment is received? I think, um, yeah, let's face it, the, the question or the answer flashed by. Let's take a look. It is, in fact, don't contact the assaultant. That, consultant, that'd be the wrong move. Yeah, so the contract manager must notify the consultant to dispute the invoice if it is incorrect. Don't let it sit on your desk, folks. You know, make sure that you're responsive and clarify. It helps build the relationship between you and the consultant as well. Okay, great. Well done, everyone. You're all monsters. Great job. <laughs> we have time to answer a couple of questions here. I've Daniel, can I start the... that? Sorry, can I start that session with just a clarification? You'll take sure the, you so. look back on um, on slide 29, which is 1.15 review of approval and final contracts. It was noted that the A and E consultant contract form link seems to come up wrong. Do you want to take a quick look and clarify that, or maybe that's got protected access? Slide 20, slide 29, 1.15. Yeah, so we can we can get that fixed. Um, I'll add in a, a, a link and go ahead and cr uh, correct that because yeah, that uh, for some reason it, it pops up because I'm I, I probably copied and pasted it while signed into the system and it thinks I'm still logged on to the server when clicking it. So we'll we'll put in a, a generic link in there from the uh, from an internet site to go ahead and uh, access that link. So my apologies, we'll get that fixed though. Thanks. Uh, being, you know, or uh, share your Bing if you want to. If you can go to the uh, cons the consultant procurement page and just copy and paste in that link, that might be able to alleviate some of the concern from that. Let's go to some of the, the questions that we have up here. So being this one's for you, regarding the method of payment for on-call agreements where multiple consultants may be awarded, will stating the method of payment will be specific to each assigned project be acceptable? We can follow up on that question uh, later. Okay. So do we have to notify the DLAE by email of executing a new contract in addition to completing the A&E consultant contract form online? Notifying the DLAE. Okay, so uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, was the first part of the question to ask about notifying the DLAE? Correct, of executing a new contract. Oh. 
I, I don't believe so. Uh, but the cons any consultant contract form uh, does need to be filled out. Uh, yeah, I don't think uh, there needs to be any notification to district. And Sherry, thank you for providing the uh, LAPM. And Raina asks, is approval needed for key personnel changes or does it apply to all staff? So we're talking about key personnel, uh, key, pers key personnel. So we're talking about your uh, investigators and principal investigators as we we use those terms. Um, you know, basically like the, the project manager, if you have like somebody who you've been negotiating with and been dealing with and who you're, who you're keying in and communicating and it's important for them and they're, they're basically on top of all the work, that is the person that you would need to um, get a change in writing from the consultant firm if there is a change in personnel. Or if there's very specialized work, um, you know, such as, uh, you know, hydrology, hydraulic uh, over a very utilized bridge and the consultant hired a subconsultant, you'll probably need to approve the, the change in consultant or lead on that as well. And being uh, somebody asked, how do you get a login account for submitting the a &E consultant contract form? Yes, just uh, send an email to us at aeoversight at dot.ca.gov. Thank you so much. Uh, I did want to go back to that uh, question about notifying the DLAE. Actually, when yeah. the first invoice is submitted, uh, first consultant invoice, that's when the 1001, 1002, and as well as a copy of the contract is included with that uh, first invoice. So that's when district will know that there is a uh, consultant contract on board. So, oh, someone found a, an error. So excellent job. Why is Verify Consultants, subconsultants required with industrial relations part of the post award and not pre-award? That's excellent. Yeah, I believe that is an error. I was thinking about that in the back of my head too. It's like, why is that located in there like that? So yes, you want to verify the subconsultants, you know, at a minimum during the, um, well, I would say probably during the negotiation process um, or, you know, right after bid opening, I would say any time after bid opening would be would be sufficient to ensure that, you know, the, the, the subconsultants are qualified to perform the work as well. So while you're developing your most highly qualified, you know, consultant selection and, you know, starting to evaluate the criteria and make your, your award, you also want to do look at some of those subconsultants that are being listed onto the project and, or onto the contract rather, and verify that, yes, they are proper. So that's, that's excellent. Great point, Terry. Uh, Bing, you may or may not know this one. What type of consultant is subject to a prevailing wage? Do all consultants need to post to the DIR, uh, Department of Industrial Relations site? Yeah, I, I don't know the detail about the uh, industrial relations, but um, generally speaking, all contracts uh, should uh, have the prevailing wage component. But it also depends on the scope of work too. So it might be on a case by case basis, but generally, yes, prevailing wage applies. And then, so yeah, so I'll get an answer on the Department of Industrial Relations site for you. One more moment here. I saw another good question. If consultant work is not completed by the expiration of the contract, can they complete their approved work? Well, they can complete their approved work. Caltrans will not reimburse it. It is not eligible for reimbursement. Uh, again, if we see that the, the time clock is ticking and you're nearing the end of your work, it's a good, good idea to check in you know, about six months, ask the consultant how it's going to need more time. I'm like, ah, I might finish on time. That's probably a good indicator to go ahead and do a contract amendment, you know, just for, uh, you know, at, at least six months, a year after that to ensure that uh, everything will be completed on time. So is the a and &E consultant form required to be sent to Caltrans or just kept on the contract file? It's required to be submitted in the database. And I, I think there was a question about login. Uh, I, I may be repeating with, with a question, but uh, yes, every agency 
has a login account with a password, and if you don't have it, send it to the email that I mentioned before, aeoversight at dot.ca.gov. There is only one account per agency. So in your agency, if there's more than one staff that has to complete the form, please share the username and password. Okay, so thank you everybody for the good questions here. And, and as we've mentioned earlier today, if we don't have the answers off the top of our heads right here, we will go ahead and get those for you. We hope that none of you have to terminate the contract, but you know, it is a reality. Sometimes things just don't work out. We get that. What we would ask our local public agencies and tribal partners to do is to first try and resolve the contract issues with the consultants. You know, maybe a, a deliverable isn't being issued, work with a consultant to have that deliverable uh, executed. Uh, perhaps, you know, there's an issue with them taking on too much work, you know, re remind them that the focus is to complete the contract on time. You know, please take steps to negotiate and mediate with the contract. That's why we recommend as a best practice to meet periodically with your consultant, whether it's every two weeks, every month. But sometimes we realize, you know, that sometimes it's just, there might be non-responsiveness from the consultant. Um, if step one fails, send the consultant a certified letter explaining the non-performance along with the contract violation. You want everything documented to reduce your local public agency's liability. It also serves as excellent documentation. And of course, retain a copy in the contract files. You know, we can't stress enough how important it is to make sure everything is documented in the contract files. If there's any ever any litigation or mediation on the contract, that's gonna be our best bet is everything being saved in the contract files. There are three types of termination procedures involved. The first is failure to perform. Obviously the consultant hasn't been performing their work and the local public agency can be you know, experiencing potential delays in the future, uh, increased in costs, uh, because you're gonna have to rebid the advertise the contract out if you can't do it in house. So that, that's definitely a reason to terminate a, a contract if the consultant's not willing to work with you. Convenience, perhaps there's an emergency that you have to tend to and that the funding no longer becomes available. Circumstances may have changed. Priorities, project may have been deprogrammed. We, we get that. Mutual agreement, perhaps there's an insolvency or you, know, you and the consultant can't come to an agreement on the first step and you just say, hey, let's just shake hands and walk away. Or uh, again, an insolvency. We've, we've seen in the past where consultants or firms go insolvent and they can't get all the work done and that's critical work that's been done. Like I said, we've seen it and sometimes these things happen, we, we get it. So at that point, you're going to need to begin to terminate the, the, the contract. Let's focus a little more on the amendment requirements. Again, we can't iterate strongly enough. It must be executed prior to the contract expiration date. The changes must be agreed to and in writing signed by both parties and executed prior to implementation. I'm aware that a lot of our cities, counties, tribes, they need to get council board of supervisor approval. So make sure we leave enough time in for that to get it up onto the agenda, approved, get the resolution and the signatures forthright onto that contract amendment. And, you know, it'd be nice if they would act as an amendment, but task orders do not amend the contract. They are just a part of the contract. It cannot be uh, added to the contract to provide additional scope into the contract and therefore amend it. So again, they have to be formally amended at some point in place. All right, being talked a little bit to you on sole source contracts. Uh, yes. Go ahead, Dean. So um, with sole source contracting, uh, that is considered non-competitive procurement and is only allowed under very uh, limited circumstances, namely uh, the, the three that are listed on this slide. Um, only 
one organization is qualified to do the work. Another justification is that an emergency exists that would not permit uh, further delay. And uh, the third allowable justification is when competition is deemed inadequate after solicitation of a number of uh, sources. So uh, the agency must document the justification for sole sourcing that includes submitting the form Exhibit 12F, the public interest finding, to the district local assistance engineer for approval. So I think I briefly mentioned that um, during our uh, Q&A uh, a few minutes uh, ago. Um, regardless, if it's a sole source contract, the agency must still develop an adequate scope and evaluation factors. Agency still must develop a cost estimate before advertisement and solicitation. And very importantly, uh, you know, conduct the negotiations to ensure a fair and reasonable cost. And again, complete that 12F form, submit it to your district local assistance engineer for review and approval. Next slide. Hey, thank you, Bean. Let's talk about overall program management of your contract management life cycle and hiring on consultants. So as we mentioned very early in the presentation, you must adopt chapter 10 of the LAPM. There's a federal regulation, section 172.5 of title 23 of the code of federal regulations that requires agencies to adopt their state procedures for architectural and engineering procurement. So please adopt chapter 10 of the LAPM if you have not done so. There are some excellent resources on the consultant selection and procurement website, including templates if you do need board or council approval. Again, just a reminder, make sure your costs are allowable in accordance with federal cost principles. Those are two CFR 200.415 to 475, and they cover the gamut of lots of items. Um, you know, included in there is indirect costs, equipment purchases, um, certain studies, et cetera. It, it's, a, it's, an, it's an excellent resource if you have some initial questions. And that, there, you know, that your consultant costs are also consistent with the contract terms, meaning if you're hiring somebody to perform you know, a geological study, you're not reimbursing them for hydrological studies. So let's just, you know, make sure that we're doing that. So prior to authorizing a final payment, the contract manager must, you know, ensure all task orders have been completed. And those are the open task orders that have been issued. Make sure you review the final deliverables and ensure that you are satisfied with the completion on the final deliverables and that they have been fully executed by the consultant. Resolve any administrative issues. So again, that might be if the deliverables aren't fully performed, uh, perhaps there's a discrepancy or issue with invoicing, may, make sure those are followed up and resolved. Uh, and perhaps there's some equipment still on the job site, you know, get on the horn with the consultant, make sure those are removed. Notify the consultant in writing that the contract has been completed and accepted. And the local public agency must disencumber any unused funds onto the contract, and that's you know to save those for future uh, contracts. So, uh, Bing, if you want to introduce the next subsection over here. Yes. So, uh, as part of the final payment invoice package after the project has been completed, uh, the agency must conduct and document an evaluation of the consultant performance. The suggested format is shown in our Exhibit 10S. In addition, uh, related to DBE, complete and submit uh, the form 17. Uh, so here, Daniel has brought up the uh, 10S. So this is the suggested uh, format. Uh, the agency, you may have uh, a different format that you can use, but um, uh, this uh, can certainly be looked at as a reference. Let's see. Uh, so related to the DB requirements, um, complete and submit form 17F or 17F1 if it's an on-call contract, and that is the final DBE utilization. I think there was a question brought up before. 
you know, that there could be changes, you know, like before negotiation, after negotiation, and maybe after the contract. So yes, we, we do realize that could happen. And uh, just, just to reiterate, the 1001 is a proposed DBE commitment. The 1002 is uh, the actual commitment uh, when, when the agency uh, agrees to a contract with a consultant. And then during the time that uh, the work is being done, of course, there could still be some changes to the DBE. And so uh, the 17F, the final utilization, will document the actual final uh, DBE usage. So uh, these documents are required as part of the final invoice package, uh, which does include multiple other documents. We won't get into that, but uh, I, the, the, the details are contained in the LAPM chapters five and 17. Next uh, slide. So contract completion, the closeout may occur after the consultant has fulfilled all the contract terms and deliverables. And as a note here, we have a project file. We can't emphasize again, <laughs> the importance of keeping a contract file. You know, as contract matters, we need to make sure that the work has been completed and invoices have been paid. Remember we have those 30 days for when an invoice is received to when a completed and eligible costs are included on the invoice to make payment as a local public agency or a tribal agency. Also finalize all documentation. And once you do finalize all the documentation, that makes the project file inactive. And make sure that you retain files for the minimum of three years after the final voucher or payment from Caltrans. Last, so let's talk about some critical points here. So, you know, make sure solicitation is performed, specify contract type and methods of payment. You know, make sure you notify your DLA of any conflict of interest. Perhaps you have a consulting firm bidding on a or proposing on a contract and you have a consultant in a management support role who works for that firm. That's pretty much a no-go. You need to notify your DLAE or you have a family member or relative. So that's basically going to require you to abstain from any part of that contract process. Make sure you verify, suspend, you know, you verify the suspension and disbarment of your consultant. Remember those are the three methodologies that we had up there before you execute that contract. Uh, Bing, if you want to cover the next section, please. Yes. So as discussed uh, earlier, the contract agreement is a requirement and, and must be documented and included. Uh, again, we have that sample boilerplate agreement, the exhibit 10R, which can be used as a preference, but uh, change it according to your contract uh, terms and work activity. Remember that prior to contract execution, to submit the financial document review package to the Independent Office of Audits and Investigation for review and acceptance of the ICR, and that is uh, if the contract is at or above one million. Uh, lastly, uh, substitution of key personnel is not allowed unless there's prior approval from the local agency, and you should make sure that the replacement personnel is as qualified to do the work as the original staff. I think that concludes our presentation, right, Daniel? Yep, we have one last metameter. Let's hope we'll ace this round. Uh, Scott? Okay, right, Daniel, we've got... Uh... Four last questions to wrap this up. Question 17, which is not a reason for terminating a contract? Failure to perform, funding issues, error on progress payment, or dispute between the LTAP, the, I, I think that's supposed to probably be the uh, local, uh, uh, local agency and consultant, which is not a reason for terminating a contract. Okay, error on progress payment is winning and it is correct. Yeah, so while it's frustrating, let's let's uh, talk about some of those uh, disputed errors with your consultant. And uh, if you can't come to an agreement, well, it may require contract termination. Now let's go to the next question, Scott. Question 18, which is not a rule of contract amendments? The local agency may add new scope to contract. It must be executed 
prior to the contract end date. Changes must be agreed to, executed by both parties, and or task orders do not amend contracts, which is not a rule of contract amendments. Okay, we got some split decision here. Let's see who's who's got it right. New scope. So yeah, we cannot add new scope to a contract, but um, you know, getting to the other one where I saw a lot of answers. So task orders cannot amend uh, contracts as well. So that's just a part of the contract and you cannot use it to amend a contract you know, for time or add additional work that's not included within the on-call contract. Uh, next question, please, Scott. Question 19, which is not true about program management of consulting costs that are federally funded? Ensure costs are allowable per contract terms. Ensure costs are in accordance with federal cost principles. Consultants cost principles or none of the above. Which is not true about program management of consulting costs that are federally funded. There's some dissension in the ranks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's see where we're at. I can advance the slide here. It is cost principles. Yeah, so we don't have to evaluate the cost principles that the consultant is using. So this means basically how they're tabulating and uh, clarifying their costs is either direct or uh, indirect. That, that will be handled separately by the Independent Office of Audit Investigations who will be uh, reviewing their ICR submittals. Okay, and question 20, this is, this is for everything. Which is not a critical part of contract management? Notify DLAE of potential conflicts of interest, verify suspension and disbarment, debarment, keep paper records of all documents in a physical contract file, or incorporate Exhibit 10R or, or similar into the agency's contract template. Which of these is not a part of a contract of contract management. All right, let's 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 see what the correct answer is. It is paper records. Yeah, so we don't need a, we don't need a uh, physical copy of it. You know, as the state of California, we're very mindful of the waste of paper or the usage of paper. So you can do electronic or a combination of the two. You might have to do both, especially when receiving uh, proposals. So yeah, it's great to have both and keep everything on file that you can. So thank you everybody. We made it to the finish line. I'm glad at least 200 of us stayed here. We do have a few minutes here to answer some questions. Let's, uh, let's take a peek here at some of the last questions. And let's see where we are. Can an on-call contract extend beyond five years if the schedule needs to be extended for compelling reasons? If not, what's the recommendations to finish out the, con to finish out the contract beyond the five-year limit? Great question. The uh, maximum term is five years. My understanding is you cannot extend it anymore. So there will have to be uh, another solicitation to complete the work. Bing, what about a project specific, or not a project specific contract, but a, um, yeah, what, what about a, like an RF, a request for a proposal that's project specific where it's not an on-call contract? Can that be more than five years? Yes, I, I believe so. Um, so on a uh, on-call contract, you have to specify a beginning and end date of the contract. But on a project specific, there has to be a beginning date, but uh, the end date should be specified, but not required. Thank you, Bing. So again, uh, somebody also explained to that point Oh, okay, hold on. One, one other question. Once we've adopted Chapter 10, is there a new renewal process or is it good forever? I think as far as we're concerned, it's a forever thing. All right. 
Excellent to hear. You know, as a best practice, we recommend that you actually put a link in to the LAPM because we do annual updates. So that way, you know, you can click on the link and it's there for, uh, you know, that you have the most recent version and also to include it in your internal procedures. Or if that is your internal procedure, you just click on the link and there it is for everybody to review. So oh, Daniel, I, I need to come back to the previous question. Go ahead. Uh, when you adopt, when you formally adopt chapter 10, if you want it to be forever, some of the language has to be stated that you are now adopting the LAPM and any future updates to the LAPM chapter 10. If you do not include uh, the caveat that includes future updates, you will have to do that uh, annually. Excellent, thank you, B. So there's another question that says, you know, projects that require NEPA and CEQA approval, the five year term certainly isn't sufficient in some of those projects, especially for the complex ones, you know, to, to retain the use of the environmental consultant to complete the environmental process. You know, is there a way around it? You know, would we recommend doing a, uh, a perhaps a, a specific contract for the PE phase being, or what, what would you recommend you know, in that scenario where, you know, there is going to be, um, you know, some, some extensive work to be performed, like a, um, you know, like a water, a water-based uh, study. So I, so the question is, can the consultant do more than one type of work in, in that particular project phase? Is that the question? I, I think it's that the, the five year term for on on your con on your uh, on call contracts is too short, especially for complex NEPA, uh, NEPA and CEQA type projects. So, what's your recommendation on that? Well, I it has to still be another solicitation. C correct, but could they go from you know on call to you know uh, project specific or phase specific? Yes, if, if that's what the agency uh, determines is the appropriate course of action. Excellent, thank you. All right, I'm having some difficulties here <laughs> with my <laughs> Zoom application. All right. So you said the local agency needs to adopt chapter 10. How does the agency do this? Are there any application templates? So we have sample templates in the any resource webpage. In the LAPAP chapter 10, uh, it details the two methods that you can formally adopt it. One is by a letter from the public works director or equivalent level manager stating that your agency is adopting chapter 10 and hopefully any future updates in that letter. The other method is via a city council or a county board resolution and uh, adopting chapter 10 and future updates. So please uh, check the LAPM chapter 10 uh, that has a little bit more detail on that. So if a consultant or subconsultant does not have a Caltrans accepted uh, indirect cost rate and the contract is less than 1 million, what documents are required to approve the consultant's proposed indirect cost rate? So I'm going to answer this kind of generally uh, again. So if it's over 1 million, at or over 1 million, then IOI will need to review and accept the ICR rate. For a contract that is under 1 million, the agency is responsible to make sure that the ICR is appropriate. So the agency itself is the one approving the ICR and it doesn't go through IOI for review and acceptance. Now, if you don't have justification and documentation to support the ICR that you have approved, then um, uh, you know, there, there could be some auditing issues down the line, but anything one, under 1 million that is uh, the agency's responsibility. Again, the procurement process did not change whether it's over or one under 1 million. The only difference is that IOI does not review and accept ICRs for anything under 1 million. 
And let's see here. Ooh, if a, this is a good question too, because I'm interested in learning this as well. If a contractor consultant asks for an engineer's estimate, should we not provide them the estimate prior to receiving bids? Can we provide estimate when all bids are received? Um, you do not share the cost estimate to, uh, to the consultant. And that only happens during the negotiation process. And I just realized the reason for that is, is because it eliminates fair and open competition. So we can't yes. do that. There cannot be any cost bias in selecting the consultant for an A&E contract. And I apologize, Kyle, you, you, you stated that we didn't cover your question. Can you either type it in the memo or perhaps you can come off of mute and we can answer your question or <laughs> hopefully we'll have an answer for you. It might have been one of those questions that we probably will have to get back uh, later. Do you recall it was a on-call agreement method or um, payment question? Here he goes. So for... Um, when he has on-call, when there's on-call uh, agreements with multiple consultants may be awarded, will stating the method of payment be specific to each assigned project or task order be acceptable? We'll, we'll get back um, via the um, uh, Q&A document. Okay, thanks. So I believe that's, uh, what's here? There was one other comment in here. So IOAI will review $500,000 in particip participation amounts by prime or sub consultant. IOAI will review contract amounts of over $1 million. Does that appear to be correct being? Um, IOAI will review any contracts that has a total amount of one million dollars, uh, and then if the prime or the sub consultant is at five hundred thousand or more, they will re review it. What we can do is um, we can also send this question to IOI just just for confirmation. So regarding inclusion of project cost estimate being included in the solicitation and or in the scoring of proposals, was there a threshold that allows cost to be considered as long as it is less than 30% of the weighted score? Um, for an any consultant contract, cost is not a factor at all. Yeah, so if we recall, we're, we're hiring the most highly qualified consultants, so cost has to be excluded from uh, scoring selection and scoring sheets. Were there any uh, additional questions? And also, you can feel free to email Bing and myself on any of the questions. Uh, and for those that were not answered, we will research and copy in the chat and pull that in and start to um, develop a Q&A sheet. And Scott, did you have any uh, final thoughts or words from the California LTAP Center? <laughs> yes, thanks so much, Daniel and Bing, for presenting this excellent information. And thank you everybody for attending. We know this was a long time and we're glad, glad about 200 of you stuck around. So thank you so much. And if you have any other questions, again, please email myself or Bing Lou.